5 to 7, I believe, on Friday evening. And then uh, Dale Bass passed away, and uh, his service is Friday as well. So uh, let's do remember those families in, in prayer. But uh, let's open with a word of prayer at this time. Uh, Brother Floyd, do you care to open us in prayer? can't be here or are facing uh, difficulties and all. We ask that you be with them. Uh, we pray for all of these. Pray for you this morning and all in your son's blessed name. We pray. Amen. Amen. And I think I told you wrong on Dale Bass. His is actually tomorrow, uh, Thursday. Um, visitation's 9 to 10 and service at 10, I believe. It's at McNabb. So, all right, um, let's look at Isaiah chapter 15, and uh, we're going to read 15, first part of, of chapter 16, and this is Isaiah's, uh, they, if you want to call it oracle, it's his word of prophecy to the Moabites um, and uh, dealing with, with their sin, uh, what God is telling him to write and what God is telling him to inform them of. And uh, the first little passage of text there, Proverbs chapter 24 at the top of your sheet, kind of goes along a little bit with this. And this is what we see Isaiah do, um, or, well, Isaiah does the right thing in this. And if you read that, that Proverbs statement, it says, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. Isaiah did not rejoice when Moab was going to fall. Um, and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn away his anger from them. Isaiah actually mourned when he realized that the Moabites were going to fall. And, um, and we see that with his own people. He mourned over what was going to happen to Israel, uh, or Judah, I'm sorry, and he mourned now, as we read in chapter 15, he mourns over the Moabites as well. Um, we have a tendency as humans, those that are our enemies, we can sometimes have a little bit of uh, pleasure within us when we see our enemy stumble or our enemy fall. And um, that's not the right attitude from what we see from Scripture. Uh, from Scripture, our attitude should be that we mourn with them just as we would our brother or sister in Christ. And, and ultimately, when we have that eternal view, then we are reminded of why we should. But when we have the earthly view of who's done wrong to me kind of thing, that's when that thought begins to creep in our mind. And so we have to keep that eternal view of things in order to prevent that from happening. So I wanted to bring that out before we go through this because... I think it's important for us to see that Isaiah was an individual that cared, even though he was, he was part of Judah. He was an Israelite that had been done wrong by the Moabites for years. He was an individual that cared for the Moabites, and he felt grief for them, even though they were enemies of him. So uh, let's read starting in, in uh, verse 1 of chapter 15, and then we'll come back and go through our questions. So. Uh, verse 1 says, An oracle concerning Moab, because uh, Ar of Mo Moab is laid waste in a night, Moab is undone. Because Kir of Moab is laid waste in a night, Moab is undone. Now, Ar and Kir are both cities in Moab. They were prominent cities in Moab. So both of those cities fall in one night, destroyed in one night. Uh, verse 2, He has gone up to the temple and to Dibon, to the high places, to weep. Over Nebo and over Mediba, Moab, Wales. On every head is baldness, every beard is shorn. In the streets they wear sackcloth. On the housetops and in the squares, everyone wails and melts in tears. Heshbon and Eliah 
cry out, their voice is heard as far as Jahaz. Therefore the armed men of Moab cry aloud. His soul trembles. My heart cries out for Moab. Her, refu her fugitives flee to Zoar, to Eglath Sheshelah. For at the ascent of Luhith, they go up weeping on the road to Horonim. They, they raise a cry of destruction. The waters of Nimrim are a desolation. The grass is withered. The ve vegetation fails. The greenery is no more. Therefore the abundance they have gained and what they have laid up, they carry away over the brook of the willows. For a cry is gone around the land of Moab. Her wailing reaches to Eglim. Her wailing reaches to bear Elam. For the waters of Dibon are full of blood. For I will bring upon Dibon even more, a line for those of Moab who escape, for the remnant of the land. Send the lamb to the ruler of the land, from Salah by way of the desert, to the mount of the daughter of Zion. Like fleeing birds, like a scattered nest, so are the daughters of Moab at the fords of the Arnon. Give counsel, grant justice, make your shade like night at the height of noon. Shelter the outcasts, do not reveal the fugitive. Let the outcasts of Moab sojourn among you, be a shelter to them from the destroyer. When the oppressor is no more, the destruction has ceased, and he who tramples underfoot has vanished from the land. Then a throne will be established in steadfast love, and on it will sit in faithfulness in the tent of David, one who judges and seeks justice and is swift to do righteousness. We have heard of the pride of Moab, how proud he is of his arrogance, his pride, and his insolence. In his idle boasting, he is not right. Therefore, let Moab wail for Moab. Let everyone wail, mourn utterly stricken for the raisin cakes of Kir Harris. Harriseth, however you say it. All right, um, I want to go back because we don't really cover this in the questions, but I want to go back to verse uh, 5 of chapter 16. It says, Then a throne will be established in steadfast love, and on it will sit faithfulness in the tent of David, one who judges and seeks justice and is swift to do righteousness. Any idea who that is talking about? Jesus, yeah. It's talking about the coming Messiah. So this is a point in time where Isaiah looks ahead to the coming of Christ. And, uh, and he's speaking, this would have been meant to be an encouragement to the people of Judah that there's a time coming when, when righteousness will prevail, uh, when justice will be sought out, and that there will be an individual that rules in that way. So that would have been an encouragement for Judah. Uh, if you go back to the beginning of chapter 15, and you just think about overall of what we just read, look at your question, it says, what do we learn from the judgment of God upon the Moabites. Uh, were they followers of God? Let's answer that one first. Were they followers of God? A God, but not the God. Uh, and I, I don't know how to pronounce this. Chemosh was the God that they worshipped. It's C-H-E-M-O-S-H was the God that they worshipped. And there's not a whole lot known about it because the Moabite people no longer exist. So um, what, they, what is known about it has actually been what was written years ago that they found you know, in archaeology digs. So there's not a lot known about what they worshipped except that that was the name. So they were not true God followers, but they did worship a God. Um, when we look at, at what God is presenting through Isaiah here to the Moabites, does anyone's sin go unnoticed? No. And it's interesting because, so we're talking about a group of people that did not worship God, but yet their sin is not going unnoticed. So they did not acknowledge God, but God still acknowledged them as part of creation, which tells us that He's sovereign over all things. And so God does not let, even though they do not acknowledge Him, God does not let their sin go unnoticed. He still judges them based upon the rules and um, the reign that He has for all people, all creation. It's no different whether you acknowledge Him or you don't acknowledge Him. 
you're still judged by the same thing. And that's that righteous rule that we, we speak about. So what does it teach about God's sovereignty? And first off, let's talk about what sovereignty actually means. So if you had to define God's sovereignty today, what would you define it as? Fairness, Fairness. okay. Loving. Sorry? Loving. Loving, okay. Isn't a sovereign nice and totally independent? Yeah. If you think about it in terms, because we do speak of a sovereign nation, you hear that on the news sometimes, and it is a nation that typically is independent of everyone else. There's not a whole lot of them anymore, but but that's not a God, but the God. Say that again. Describe him not as a God, but the God. The God. Mm -hmm. I always think of sovereign as being in full authority. Full authority. Uh, if you look up Webster's Dictionary, description of God's sovereignty, not just sovereignty itself, but God's sovereignty, it is that He has the power, wisdom, and authority to do whatever He chooses in His kingdom. Now, I thought it was interesting that those in there in His kingdom, um, His kingdom is everything. So He has the power, wisdom, and authority to do whatever He chooses throughout the universe. Um, now, what he chooses to do uh, is right, and therefore we call him a righteous God. And he has the authority to do that because he's the only perfect individual that there is. And of course, we include Christ in that. I'm talking about the Trinity now. Um, and he has the power to do anything. If someone that can literally, literally speak something into existence has the power to do whatever. So when we think about God's sovereignty, Him being sovereign over all peoples, then we understand then that no one's sin will go unnoticed because in His wisdom all sin must be dealt with. Otherwise individuals do have this feeling of being treated unfairly, but when we look at God through the eyes of righteousness and through the eyes of His wisdom, we see that He is a fair God across all people. So um, God's sovereignty is important for us to understand, and letter D there is really where I wanted to get. How does God's sovereignty impact our life? Um, if we have an understanding that God is sovereign over everything, then how does that impact the daily life that we would live? And, and let me preface it with this concept. Um, sometimes we have an understanding, and this is, it's true, that throughout service, you know, God's Spirit is with us, and, um, and what occurs, if we're trying to follow God, what occurs is what God would want to occur. And we would say that God was sovereign over our service. Um, we sometimes reach out to God and we pray for His will to be done in our life, whatever the situation may be. We would be asking for His sovereignty then in that situation. But then there's sometimes in life where we just kind of go at life on our own. And I want to give you some small illustrations, but I think are just as important. Those of you that have had children that have played some type of sport, um, then you may remember going and watching, whether it be it's football season now, so whether you go watch a football game or a basketball game, baseball game, whatever it was, and you go there and you think, okay, I'm going to watch my kid play baseball or football. And you don't really think much about, about God. You don't really think, and not that you're trying to exclude Him, not that you're trying to leave Him out, but you just kind of get you know, wrapped up as a grandparent or parent, you get wrapped up in the, I'm just going to watch him play baseball, kind of an entertainment kind of thing. And we forget that if God is truly sovereign over everything, then he's sovereign over that football game that's going on as well. Something probably that our students and our children don't think too much about. Also, you know, if you think about, um, I know Ian does some rodeo and type stuff. Uh, God's sovereign over that rodeo that's going on. He's sovereign over your drive here this morning. He'll be sovereign over your drive home from here. 
He's sovereign over what happens the rest of today in your individual life. Because we take this high level of God sometimes, and we say that, that He's sovereign over like a nation. So what happens in the United States, like God's watching out, even though we may not agree with the root of leader in place, we sit back and we say, well, God's probably got a purpose for that because He's sovereign over things. But then we forget to bring that down to like the small level of our individual life that goes on in the next five minutes even. And our understanding of what we're talking about right now, if we are focusing on God, God is sovereign over that as well. So when we look at, at this and what we're about to study about the Moabites and their reaction, we see that everything that they do, God is sovereign over. In our life today, what would change if we understood that God was sovereign over every single moment and decision that we make? And how would it change our life? And I understand that, like, I don't think there's anyone sitting here that would say, I don't want God to be sovereign over my life. I don't want God's influence. I don't want His direction. But I also know that sometimes we get busy with life. Um, the thing I relate a lot of things back to is, is my farm background because I grew up in that and spent a lot of time in that. And when, you, when harvest, which is about to start, or if it hadn't already for some, when harvest started, you had kind of one thing on your mind, and you got this tunnel vision of, I've got a crop to get out of the field, and I've got to get it done. So every morning you wake up and you think, what have I got to do to get the equipment ready to go in order to, to harvest? And so you kind of become tunnel vision, so to speak, in that that's the job i got to get done. And I would forget that like throughout the day, like I may not have seen a lot of people other than my dad or my brother, but you know, if you haul grain off or whatever, you're coming in contact with people at the elevator or gas station, you got to stop and get gas, whatever. And I, I would forget along the way, because I was focused on the crops got to get out of the field, that I would forget that God is sovereign over every moment that's going on. So every breakdown that occurred, I would get frustrated with. And yet I, don't under, I didn't understand in the moment, and still don't really understand, like why those things occurred. Um, I remember there was one, I was actually working a full-time job, I was going to college, this was the last couple of years I farmed, and it was harvest season, and I was trying to get a um, crop of beans out, and I broke a belt on the combine, and it was like 4.45, John Deere Place closed at 5 o'clock, so I call them, they've got it, they're going to wait, so I take off. Well, this is a day that I've took off work, kind of set school aside so that I could get harvest and you have the breakdown kind of thing. And uh, I'm driving back, not really paying attention to how fast I'm driving, and uh, all of a sudden there's blue lights behind me. And so I pull over and the guy said, do you realize that you're going 75 and a 45? And I said, uh, no, I don't. And he said, well, I know she didn't have your seatbelt on because this is back in the days when seatbelt was kind of the first thing. And he said, well, I'm gonna write you a seatbelt ticket um, because, you know, because I, I explained what was going on. And I guess he felt sorry for me. I don't know. But um, he said, I'm going to give you a seatbelt ticket. He said, it'll save you money and it won't go on your insurance. I said, thanks, man. You know, appreciate it very much. And so reflecting back on that, you know, it was a reminder to me that I had to slow down and remember that God was in control of all things. And um, it was the first ticket I ever got. And uh, so I remember like calling dad and saying, man, I'm so sorry, you know, I got this ticket because I was still on their insurance. And he said, don't worry about it, go fix the combine. <laughs> and then, I mean, it was a response, you know. But, um, but I had to slow down and remember that God was in control and I didn't get it at that moment. And it wasn't until years later that it really kind of clicked with me what God was doing in that time. When we realize that God's sovereign over every situation, I think it would probably change the way we react to things. Difficulties that come up, we would probably react in a different way. Instead of us responding in our own personal thoughts or immediate thoughts about what just happened, we would probably sit back and ask, what is God doing through this? And then we would respond or not respond, uh, depending on you know, the situation. So when we look at this, realize that God was sovereign over everything going on. 
He's not just sovereign over what Isaiah is saying. He's sovereign over what the Moabites happens to them. And based on their response, we'll determine much of what happens to them. So let's look at verse 2 then. And what do we learn from verse 2 about the Moabites? So verse 2 says, He has gone up to the temple and to dive onto the high places to weep over Nebo and over Mediba, Moab whales. On every head is baldness and every beard is shorn. So let's take the last couple of lines there. Um, on every head is baldness and every beard is shorn. What does that mean in Old Testament times? When someone shaves their head, mourning. So they are, because of what's going on, you know, the fall of the two cities that we read about in verse 1, they are now in a state of mourning. Now let's go back to the first part of, chapter, of verse 2. It says, He has gone up to the temple. Now, if we were talking about a group of godly people, true God people, going up to the temple would be a good thing, Right? But he says he's gone up to the temple and to Dibon, to the high places to weep. So where did they turn at this moment in time? To the true God or to their false God? Their false God, yeah, Chemosh or however you say that name. Um, so they are mourning. That's a good response. But they're turning to the wrong place. Um, when we look throughout our life, Today, we can probably identify times in our own life where maybe we have turned to the wrong place. We have mourned over what's went on, but maybe we've turned to the wrong place. Maybe you haven't experienced that. Maybe looking back in times past, maybe you see that that, that did occur. But if we look around us today, especially to people who have no church affiliation, no God affiliation, and you can look and see to the things that they turn to, such as drugs, alcohol, entertainment, whatever it may be. Sometimes it's even family. They turn to family. Instead, they should be turning to God. And we can see that people turn to a lot of different places. The Moabites turned to the wrong place. Their response in mourning was good because they realized something was wrong. But where they turned was wrong. So question three, did God hear the weeping and mourning that the Moabites were doing? He did hear it. But what was his response to it? Did he say, um, this is not in the Bible, so this is me making this up, but did God say, all right, I see you're mourning and you're weeping. You've got a good response. You're just not turning to the right place, but that's okay. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and forgive you because I know your heart's in the right place. Like we hear that statement a lot, right? Well, their heart was in the right place. Yeah, but we sometimes say that, don't we? That their heart's in the right place, and really their heart's not in the right place. Otherwise, they would be turning to God. Um, that's what we, we see here. You know, God doesn't say, well, I see your response is good, like you're, you're mourning, you're weeping about it, so I'm going to go ahead and forgive you because you, you kind of got it right. That's not the way God works. He would not be a righteous God if that's the way He worked. So God says, I hear your mourning and weeping, but you're turning to the wrong place. Um, even though you're, you're weeping, you're physically showing that, that you know what you've done is wrong, you're still turning to the wrong place. So question four then, from verse um, four, what do we find that they found peace and comfort in in times past? Where do ungodly people find peace and comfort today? So verse 4 says, Heshbon and Eleh Ele cry out, their voice is heard as far as Jahaz. Therefore the armed men of Moab cry loud, his soul trembles. If you were to read through that and, and pick out something out of verse 4 that they had placed their trust in in the past, what would you say that they place their trust in? Knowing, yeah, the armed men, army, uh, their power. Remember, this was a group of people that had overpowered Judah and Israel in times past. Remember, it's two different places now. They had split from each other. So Israel and Judah, two different places. So this was a group of people that by their, their might, power, 
uh, physical power. They had uh, given all kinds of trouble to both Israel and Judah and had overtaken Israel. Um, so, along with the Assyrians. So, um, this is a time where in times past they've leaned upon the strength of their army. Physical strength, human power. They've leaned upon that in times past in order to get them through whatever was going on. So now what they see is that their armed men are crying out. So I want you to try and think back, if you can ever think of this, to a moment in time where there was something, maybe as a child, that you had found comfort in, and then all of a sudden that was gone. It may be that there was a family member, a grandparent, uh, a parent, whatever it may be, that you always kind of turn to for help, and then all of a sudden they're gone. Uh, do you remember your feeling in that moment? Anybody ever experienced that by, by chance? I remember um, I was very close to my grandmother, my mom's mom. And when I was in sixth grade, she passed. And um, I'd spent summers with her mom and dad farm. When I was too young to go to the farm during wheat harvest, I would stay for two weeks at her house. And mom would stop by just to acknowledge that I was still her kid. But... Uh, but I stayed with them, and, and we lived right down the road, so it wasn't like it was a long way off. But um, So I was always at her house, and she was just, I mean, the first 10 years of my life, she was it. And so I, I still remember the day she died when Mom came out and told me, and uh, I was bringing wood in. I'll never forget it. I was bringing wood in, and I just went to work. We had more wood in the house that day than we've ever had in our life. Um. And it felt like there was something gone. Like the person that I could always turn to and talk to wasn't there anymore. Even though I was sixth grade, it was still real to me. And, I, and today, still, I can kind of get a little bit uh, emotional about it. But I don't know if you've had that in your life. Like there's the individual that you always turn to that seems like they always have the answers for things. And then they're just gone. Um, this is where the people of Moab were at this point. They had always turned to the strength of their army. And now they turn to the strength of their army in this time and the army men are crying basically. Is, that's it. If you want to think of it in that way. Like they don't know what to do. They're overcome. They're uh, being destroyed as well. So the place that they turn to for safety and security is gone. Now we know they should have been turning to God because He's never going to be gone. But when we think about today, what do we find people turning to today that will end up um, causing them to have this type of feeling at some point? Now, for the first little bit of time, maybe they find some comfort or peace, short period of time, but then it's gone. So what do we find people turn to today? Obviously, other individuals have kind of already covered that one, but what else would they turn to? Mm -hmm. What about, um, let, let's think about it from the standpoint, because all of us here today are people that attend church, faith, I'm going to say faithfully, regularly. So what about people such as us, attend church faithfully, what do we find ourselves turning to sometimes other than God? Because hopefully the drugs and alcohol is not <laughs> what we find. <laughs> Okay, fellow church people that at some point we're going to be disappointed when we do that, or let down maybe. Yeah. What else? Yeah, I was going to say do we ever turn to our career to try and find security or peace? I think it happens sometimes. What about maybe places or positions in church? If we, th we think that if we have just that next one, whatever it may be, that we will then find peace with God maybe through that, through having that title, if you want to call it that. 
Um, what about financial giving? I think maybe if we give a little more, we'll be more at peace about things. I'm not saying y'all deal with this. I'm just saying overall church is what I'm talking about. Um, there's quite a number of things because it's easy for us to look outside of church and say this is what the world deals with. But we have to acknowledge too that even within church, church people, we still deal with these type of things. Maybe they're different. It's not drugs or alcohol. It, it, it's, but it is things that still, just as we said earlier, God doesn't overlook any sin. It's still things that can be sinful. It's just not identified as sinful in the world as what we might really understand that it is. Sometimes we turn to just say, feeling sorry for ourselves instead of trying to see what God's will is, is and what happened. Mm-hmm. You know, what's going on. Yeah. See God's will in it. Yeah. It's putting anything before God. It is. Anything. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes as a church, we find security. And, and, and let me say this. We just had our deacon trustees meeting last night. Financially, we have been tremendously blessed as a church. I, I, can't, I can't understand how it keeps happening, it, but it does. And I know it's because of God uh, and the hearts of people that are being obedient to God. I'm not trying to leave that out. But um, we are tremendously blessed. But it would be wrong of us to find our security in our finances. That would be tremendously wrong. Y'all have had some wonderful ministers in times past. But it would be wrong to find our security in those individuals too. Like we've got to, everyone has got to be focusing us toward God in everything we do. Um, we can feel like pity party, if you want to call it, maybe that or, or something along that line. And, uh, and we forget to acknowledge, you know, God. With the Moabites, we find here that what they had always turned to is no longer there. So they're just at a tremendous loss at this point. So let's go on into uh, question five. What do we find Isaiah's reaction to be in verse five? And why is this his reaction? Should it be ours? Uh, was there any relationship between Moabites and Israelites? So verse five, my heart cries out for Moab. Her fugitives flee to Zoar, to Eglith Shishelia. For at the ascent of Luith, they go up weeping. On the road to Hor, uh, Horonium, they raise a cry of destruction. So what is, uh, what is Isaiah's reaction to what he sees going on with the Moabite people? Sympathetic. He's sympathetic for them. He has sympathy, he has... Uh, compassion, we could say, uh, for them. It's similar reaction, I think we've talked about this before, similar reaction that we see when Jesus looks out over Jerusalem, when he's about to make his triumphal entry, and he looks out over Jerusalem, and he says, if only you would have acknowledged you know, me as Lord, and they didn't. Um, Isaiah's probably looking here and saying, you know, if only, and we'll talk about it in a minute, if you get down to, to chapter 16, verse 1, if only they would have turned to the Mount of Zion, which Jerusalem, acknowledging God. Only they would have turned there, but they didn't. And so he has compassion for them. Uh, it doesn't change God's sovereignty, and it doesn't change God's um, judgment upon them, but he has compassion for them. Now, should this be our reaction? Yeah, it should be ours. Is this hard for us to do humanly? Why is it so hard, do you think? Or do you think it was hard for Isaiah to do? Now, I don't know Isaiah was a prophet, but still, we see other prophets, such as Jonah, that struggled in living the way God wanted and doing the direction God wanted him to do, right? So we know prophets were human people, too. So do you think this was hard for Isaiah to do? And why, why would it have been hard for him? It's not our nature. It wasn't his nature. <coughs> Yeah, he was actually part of the group of people that the Moabites had been fighting with and persecuting for a long period of time. Could have, now I don't know this, so this is me reading into it, don't take it as, as scripture, but he could have had family members 
that might have been killed in war um, if Moabites and Judahites were fighting with each other. I don't know that. I'm just saying he could have. Could have been people that he knew that would have been killed by them. So there's, there's connection at least somehow there and a negative one. So it would have been hard from a physical standpoint for him. Um, in the same way, sometimes we have that connection. And uh, sometimes it can be a love for country that can make us have that feeling toward another group of people. So we, we have our military that I'm extremely thankful for that goes over and fights. They get ambushed by whoever, Iran, Iraq, whatever. They get ambushed by a group of people and our thoughts turn negatively toward sometimes that whole group of people in that country when this may only be a small subset of the group that actually done that. But our thoughts can turn negative toward them. In reality, um, there should be some sort of mourning that that individual is far from God. Uh, that's hard for us to do, though, at times. Um, you go beyond war battles and you get to individuals that has just done us wrong. Someone that physically abused someone. And there should be somewhat of a, now we should not like what happened, I'm not saying that, but there should be some type of a mourning that that individual that done the wrong is not in good standing with God. Now that's hard for us to do, again, because they've inflicted pain, hurt, uh, sometimes a lifetime worth of pain and hurt on someone. But that's that compassion side that we see of Christ, and we see it here of Isaiah. You know, Christ knew what these people that he's mourning over were about to do to him, and yet he still weeps over them. Was there a relationship between the Moabites and the Israelites other than they were fighting with each other? Any kind of uh, physical relation, or uh, not physical, any kind of uh, family relationship that we know of? Um, close, close. So the Moabites... Um, actually descended from Lot. Um, when, when Sodom and Gomorrah happened, Lot, his wife and two daughters flee. Wife gets turned to pillar of salt. Two daughters and Lot go and flee into the mountains, to the caves. And the daughters think that all of the earth inhabitants is wiped out, and so they basically seduce their dad. They have a child with their dad. One of the daughters had a child that was named Moab. And it means from the father is what it means. And uh, from that came the Moabite people. So if we go back, if you remember, what relation was Lot to Abraham? He was a nephew. So you have a family connection here between these groups of people. Now, whether Isaiah is looking back, knowing you know that family connection that, hey, these are all ultimately we're all related in some way, or not, I don't know. But he has compassion for them. And then uh, question six, what were the Moabite people clinging to in verse 7? So verse 7 says, Therefore the abundance they have gained and what they have laid up, they carry away over the brook of the willows. Or, yeah. Their earthly possessions. Um, so the thing that they had turned to in the past, which was the army, is now crumbled. So the next thing they turn to is what they have, the earthly possessions, which are going to fade and be gone. But that's where they turn. And you think about today, and we find that people tend to turn to those type things. Part of it is because they can, they're tangible. They can see them, touch them, hold them, have them. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting the, um, 
the change that the Depression era brought on the mindset of people in even in this community or, or surrounding areas. But the Depression brought on this mindset of we've got to hold on to everything. Um, my dad to this day, and he was on the, the tail end. I mean, he was really reaping the results of what his parents went through in, in the Depression. Today, you walk in his shop and it is covered with everything. Uh, now, you could say he was a hoarder, but, but his mindset is, you know, growing up on a farm, we're going to use that somewhere. And a lot of times he did, you know, and, and I'm not faulting him for that. But there's a, there's a mindset that developed through that Depression time of we can't get rid of anything because we don't know if we're going to be able to get it. Um, apparently in the 70s, early 70s, there was kind of a time period as well where it was hard to get certain things. Um, a little bit similar to what we went through with, with COVID on the tail end of it where you walk in the store and shelves are not completely full like we were used to seeing them. And sometimes today you still have a hard time getting certain things. Um, but the mindset of people, some people, not all, but some people changed that depression time to where we've got to cling tightly to possessions. Now, I'm not saying that that's all wrong. What I am saying, though, is it can take our mind off of God is going to sustain us through everything. And if we develop that into a lifestyle of we're going to cling to possessions, then we've really distracted ourselves from what God's role is his sovereign role in our life in caring for us in every situation. So we have to be careful with that, that we don't become like what the Moabites did and cling to stuff. Some of that goes back to the Cold War era, too, where, you know, mm-hmm. I know my mom and dad, they had stuff in the basement and stuff, you know, and food. And yeah. Which, uh, you know, that was the... Preparing for, yeah, what may come, yeah. And... And I'm not knocking, I mean, there is something to be said for being prepared for, for things. Uh, God gives us that wisdom, but at the same time, our reliance still has to be that God's going to care for us through whatever it may be. Um, question 7, from verse 8, how far does the judgment extend? So if you look at verse 8, it says, For a cry has gone around the land of Moab, her wailing reaches to Eglim, her wailing reaches to bear Elam. Now, unless you have a map of the country, this really doesn't make a lot of sense, but the way I understand, if I read this correctly, is the invasion actually came from the north. Uh, these two cities, Eglam and Bear Elam, were southern cities of the country of Moab. So basically what it's saying is from the north all the way to the south. So it reaches the whole area. There was nothing that was excluded is the concept that's trying to be uh, instructed here, that, that nothing was exempt from the judgment of God throughout the land of Moab. Uh, from verse 9, question 8, from verse 9, what would cause the water to turn to blood? And in light of verse 4, why would this be mentioned here? So. Verse 9, for the waters of Dibon are full of blood, for I will bring upon Dibon even more a line for those of Moab who escape for the remnant of the land. What would cause the water to turn to blood? This is kind of a common, I say common, it's mentioned throughout the Bible several times, like in great destructions that water will turn to blood kind of thing. You see it in Revelation, talked about that, that uh, uh, the rivers would flow red up to the horse's bridle. Um, so what, what causes that to uh, to occur. I kind of already talked about it. But. Going back to Moses, and, the, and there was, you know, he cast his staff out in the waters and it turned into blood. Plague. Um, that had been, I mean, I don't know, I'm asking, you think that had been passed down? Um, it's uh, from a spiritual sense, it could be, <laughs> but from a physical sense, it's more about it's just the destruction of people. Basically, so many are being killed that the blood flows, um, the water flows as blood. It's not fully blood, but it's red, such as, as that. You see that in Revelation as well. Um, the Battle of Armageddon that's kind of talked about, that's what's kind of being spoken of there as well. So in light of verse 4, going back to verse 4, which is where we read that they had relied upon their army, 
So now they see their army men being destroyed, the water's running red because of the great destruction that comes, which drives home even more that they cannot rely on what they relied on in the past. Uh, question 9 from chapter 16, verse 1. Where is Isaiah's words, um, were, sorry, that's spelled wrong, were Isaiah's words encouraging, no, I'll get it right in a minute. Where is Isaiah's words encouraging the Moab, Moabites to turn? To God. To God. That uh, verse 1, send the lamb to the ruler of the land, um, from some lie by, the le by way of the desert to the mountain of the daughter of Zion. In Old Testament times, when someone would send a lamb to a ruler, it was a sign of humbling themselves before them, bowing to them. It was kind of that, it was based upon that sacrificial type thing. And this was a sign of humility. So Isaiah is saying, look, send a lamb to Jerusalem, basically, is where, and humble yourself before the one true God, and, um, and things will be much better for you. Um, they did not do this. And we read on over uh, verse 6 of chapter 16. Uh, it's question 10. What's the ultimate issue of the Moabites? And what did this prevent them from doing even when they were in need? Um, verse 6, we have heard of the pride of Moab, how proud he is of his arrogance, his pride, his insolence, and his idle boasting, he is not right. What's the ultimate issue with Moab? I mean, ultimately, they didn't turn to God. But what prevented them from turning to God? Their pride, right? So, thinking about what we just talked about in question nine, so their pride was an issue. Isaiah's telling them, send a lamb, humble yourself before God, before Jerusalem, and they won't do it. And what prevented them from actually sending the lamb? their pride. They did not want to humble themselves in front of others. And what do we find is still an issue today at about 11.30, 11.45 every Sunday morning. Yeah. Pride prevents people from actually, and even, maybe not even going forward, but just submitting to God. Uh, maybe it's where they're standing, but they just won't submit to God. Uh, we still see that today. Uh, it's in a different way than what we're talking about here, but it's still a spiritual sense. And, uh, and it's not just Sundays, it's every day, I mean, throughout, that our pride prevents us from doing that. And we get caught up in what we've always trusted in before, our ability. One of the hard things for, um, and I'm going to speak from a, a, a male standpoint, one of the hard things for males to do when they get older in life is to acknowledge that we can't do what we used to be able to do. Uh, just kind of that submitting that I need help from someone else to do some of the things, even around the house kind of thing. And uh, <laughs> it's not just males either, right? <laughs> um, but it, it's, uh, it is hard. And, and we, I think as humans, I can speak from the male side just because I know that better, but I think in terms of all of us as humans, it's hard for us to admit, to let go of that pride that we can do it. And that pride develops so early because you take a child that's learning to tie their shoe and what's one of the first things you hear them say? I can do it myself. I can do it myself. <laughs> and probably almost every child, maybe not everyone, but most children have said that somewhere along the way. And where do they learn that from? Well, one is from a fallen nature. But secondly, they see it patterned, too. I mean, they see us live that, or they see it in friends or, or whatever it may be, and they learn it, siblings, maybe. So it's a pride is still an issue that we have to deal with. In some ways, though, it's kind of a protective measure on your part. So when you, you've either been disappointed in the past, or they don't do it up to your standard, because you probably have pride, but you know what I mean? So pride is a big part of it. So mm -hmm.
my cousin, her husband, just almost went to blows about, <laughs> I can do it. Leave it alone. Let me do it. She'd get tangled up with her fishing line. Well, he'd come in more. She'd say, I can do it. Just leave me alone. And they did that all day one day. Of course, they were in the boat with us. And I told Floyd, I said, next time, they're not both riding in the same boat. <laughs> 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 but it was just constant back and forth, or he'd do something and she'd get on to him because he didn't do it right, you know. <laughs> it was funny, but it wasn't funny. <laughs> Not when you're stuck in a boat with him. <laughs> it's funny now, but it wasn't then. <laughs> when we were, uh, when the boys were younger, we all went on a float trip one time on Buffalo River, and the water was down a little bit. It was in the summer. And, um, Matthew was old enough that he was physically strong enough to do, you know, paddling kind of stuff. So Matthew and Jennifer went in the same canoe, and Michael and I did because Michael was little and he couldn't. So uh, Michael and I were doing fine. Matthew and Jennifer fought the whole way <laughs> because one of them would think they'd need to paddle on one side and the other would think they'd need to paddle on the other. And she didn't want to be up under any limbs or branches because she's terrified of snakes. And Matthew would get them over there somehow, you know, whether intentional or not, I don't know. <laughs> But it, that reminded me, you know, of that. And whether it was pride or whether it was stubbornness, I don't know. And maybe both those are kind of the same thing to some degree. But we all do it. I think we revert back to our childhood on a lot of things. Yes, sir. You know, we we do struggle with pride, and even a church as a body can struggle with pride sometimes too. Uh, sometimes churches are too proud to take help from somewhere else. Sometimes they're too stubborn to take help from somewhere else. Um, but we've got to remember, too, that a church is made up of people. And so that, that overall church idea or mentality comes from somewhere as well. And it comes from the people within. But uh, we see that, you know, here that um, the Moabites' pride kept them from actually going to where they needed to go. And then question 11, it seems that the Moabites' pride prevented them from submitting to the king of Judah. This was their only means of salvation. How does this apply to our life today? We've kind of talked about that some already. Um, I wonder if as churches, um, and I, I don't have anything in mind, so I'm just asking the question. I wonder if as churches, do we ever unintentionally promote people turning somewhere other than God? And again, I think it would be unintentional. I don't think it would be intentionally that we would say, hey, you need to turn, you don't need to turn to God, you need to go here. But I wonder if we ever unintentionally direct people in a way other than God. And I don't know if that's true or not. Again, <clears throat> if that is the case, just as I talked about with pride a minute ago, we have to remember that a church is made up of people. So if a church unintentionally directs, that would mean the people themselves would be unintentionally directing as well. So we have to make sure that we're always directing people to God. Now, God does place messengers in this, in this world or resources in this world to help in certain situations. So, I mean, God does work through people, so I'm not saying that we should never take advantage of wisdom from others that God has given them. But we do have to be careful that, that we point in the right place. Um, one of the things that has become very, um, very much so a part of our life today than it was 20 years ago is uh, the number of counselors in the world. And um, I have nothing against counselors, but um, the counselors we should be promoting would be those that are faith-based because they're bringing God into the equation. And if we're promoting outside of faith-based, then we're really asking them to turn to a worldly understanding of things. And that's not, not good. Two different groups of armies fighting each other. But 
where is the big arm at? Take like over in Ukraine now. The women, children, little babies, mm. many of them getting killed. A lady walking the streets has lost part of, part of her family. Her home has been destroyed. She has no job. Mm-hmm. You know, these little children walking the street, the vacant streets. Right. Uh, Because the only ones that suffering, and if that don't if that don't get to us, then there's something wrong with our heart. All right. Yeah, it causes uh, difficulty for all people involved in those, the families of the the people fighting, and and even those that don't even have a a dog in the fight, so to speak. And that's why these mobile people work, but mm. even the little innocent children are suffering. That's right. That's exactly right. Um, if you look at, at verse 7 of chapter 16, real quick again, and we'll end with this. Verse 7, the beginning of it says, Therefore, so remember, whenever we see that word, therefore, we have to go backward to see what's actually being talked about. And he says, Therefore, let Moab wail for Moab. So why should Moab wail for Moab? If you go back to verse 6 right above it, it says, um, how proud he is, his arrogance, his pride, his insolence. In his idle boasting, he is not right. And therefore, let Moab wail for Moab. And I think what Isaiah is probably saying here is, like, I have compassion for them. Um, I've tried to share with them where they need to turn, but their pride is preventing him from it. And this may be a little bit of Isaiah realizing there's nothing more he can do. You know, he's, he's sent the message that God told him to send. He does have compassion for them. He wants them to turn to God, but they're not doing it, and he can't make them do it. And, you know, we get to that point sometimes even with people today. Like we, we have compassion for them, and we, we shouldn't lose that compassion. I don't think Isaiah did. But their sinfulness will not let them turn to God. Not that they can't, they could, but just because they're so bogged in sin, they will not. And so Isaiah is saying, you know, let the weeping continue on. Um, I've shared with them where they need to go, but they're not going there, and their pride's standing in the way, and therefore they're going to have to wail. They're going to have to suffer the judgment um, here in, in Moab anyway. Right. That's right. And our hope is, and, and I don't think Isaiah gave up hope except he knew what the end result was going to be, that they were going to be destroyed. So he because God had shared it with him. But we don't know that. You know, God's not told us what's going to be the end result. So we can't give up. You know, that compassion's still got to be there. We still got to try and find the way when God motivates us or moves us to share with them. Um, we still have to try to find that way to do it. But because um, we don't know the end result. And our hope is that the end result will be different than what it was here. That that, if it is pride, that that pride would go down and that they would humble themselves, come before. Um, and, you know, there, there has to be a portion of us that, that reminds ourselves that we were there one time. You know, we, we, didn't, we weren't born a Christian. We weren't born saved. We weren't born sinless. We were all sinners at some point in time, and we had to come to the same place that these individuals will have to come to, and that's an acknowledgement that we need Christ, and uh, that should be a motivation for us too. Any last thoughts or questions? All right, well, let's uh, let's go into prayer requests uh, for just a moment. 
and uh, then we'll have a closing prayer. I didn't mention the families that have lost loved ones.